What's up guys, Lost here. So today we're implementing multiple character support along with some bonus shadows. Enjoy the video guys. Let's jump right into it. So in the previous episode, I said that if both a parent and a child object have a create event, the child's create event will overwrite the parent's event. And while true, there is a method that allows both. So thanks to David for telling me about this. So what we're doing is cutting the float variable from the child's create event and placing it in the parent's create event, as we will keep all the technical variables in there. Back in the child's create event, we then specify the function event inherited. This will run the code in the parent first, and then set the movement variable along with the GX and GY variable through the script. Now we have to duplicate the green lantern and rename it Wolverine, linking the sprite. We then do the same thing for Deadpool. Now if we go into object control, we need to copy and paste this line of code to spawn Wolverine and Deadpool. The only difference is that we need to minus 13 times 2 on the Y axis to place Wolverine on the hex above the green lantern, while we need to plus 13 times 2 on the Y axis to place Deadpool uh, on the hex beneath the green lantern. Now as you can see, everyone is aligned properly. But there are a whole range of issues now. The first being is that the depths are all messed up. The second being that all of them are being outlined. Uh, and this is because technically the mouse is over all of them at the same time. Thankfully, I do have a solution to this. First, let's sort the depth issue though, as that's the most simple to fix. So in parent player, in the create event, let's just use depth equals minus y. And there we go. They're all lined up all right now. However, they can also move onto the same hex, and so we'll have to fix that, as it's probably beneficial if they don't fuse together. This isn't Dragon Ball Z after all. So firstly, in script player 10 we need to remove player selected equals instance position, because technically the mouse can be over all of them at the same time, which means it's just going to be random who gets selected if we do it like this, which probably isn't ideal in a strategy game, unless you want to end up being trashed by Jim fucking Sterlingson. Thank God for him. So this means that we need to create a new script called script get top selected. In this script, we're going to create a DS grid two wide and four high. Let's just say for arguments, though we'll resize it later based on how many things get added. Anyway, when we left click, we'll add all player instances under the mouse to a grid. We're going to store the instances ID in the first position and the depth in the second then all we have to do is sort the grid based on the depth in ascending order and then we'll just make the top one selected as this will be the instance with lowest depth. Right off the bat let's create a DS grid called under mouse. We then need two temporary variables called posx and posy. These are obviously going to determine the position in the grid that we have. So let's take control of parent player using the with statement. Remember this is being called from script player 10, where we have just left click. Let's say if the instance is beneath the mouse, then we'll create a temporary variable called grid, linking it to the grid that we've just created in object control. Then we're going to use DS grid add, and as you can see, we are adding the ID at posx and y, which are currently both zero. So it'll be added at the very first position in the grid. After we've added the ID, we make posx1 and then we add the depth to the grid. Uh, and then after we've added that, we add 1 to pos y and set posx back to 0. This is so that the next thing that gets added won't be placed in the same position of the grid, which would overwrite the first instance that we've just added. Then we resize the grid to 2 and pos y. This is because the grid is always going to be too wide as it stores the id and the depth. And we use pos y there because we need to allow that to be flexible, as we might only have clicked on one character or potentially all three of them. So this will just resize the grid to the amount of data stored inside it. Then we sort the DS grid, and as you can see, we are sorting the grid by column one instead of zero, because column zero stores the ID, while column one stores the depth, which of course is the important piece of information here. Then we set player selected uh, to equal DS grid get at position 0, 0, which is the very first point in the grid, which is the ID of the instance at the top of the grid. So then we just destroy the grid as we no longer need it at this point. 
So as you can see, we have appeased Jim fucking Sterlingson. Thank God for him, as we can now reliably select a character accurately without it being a total random shit show. However, they are still all being highlighted, which we'll come on to shortly. Okay, so in object controls create event, add the variable player hover, which I totally didn't do off camera by accident, except that's exactly what I did, but never mind. So I'm going to retype it just for you. Okay, now to the parent player's draw event. We need a new temporary variable called is hovered, which we're going to use a new method to determine who the mouse is over. So let's replace this else if statement with is hovered equals self. So at the bottom of script player 10, let's check to see if the mouse is over a parent player, which of course means if the mouse is over any of its child's objects. Uh, if it is, we will run the script get top hovered, which is almost exactly the same as script get top, top selected. Uh, but first though, we need to add else. So if the mouse isn't over a player, then player hover will equal no one. So let's create that script now. As you can see, this is exactly the same as the previous script with only a few changes. The first being that we have renamed the grid to under mouse hover, and instead of setting player selected at the end, we set player hover instead. So I'm not really going to explain this one, as we've just sort of been through this and I feel like I've covered it, so yeah. And there we go, it's starting to take shape a little bit now, isn't it? Uh, the objects can be hovered and selected accurately and precisely now. Um, I, I honestly haven't checked how much the constant grid creating and stuff affects performance, uh, but since it's only when we either click an instance or have the mouse over one, I don't think it should be too bad, uh, but I'm pretty sure there could be further optimization here, but I'm not too worried about it. It's good practice to optimize things as best you can, but honestly, like if you worry about every little detail, you'll never get anywhere with the project, so in most cases, uh, it's probably just all right to keep it as it is. So there's another problem with depths that I forgot to mention. Uh, we set the depth when the characters are created, but we never play with them again after they move. Uh, and that has to change because, as you can see, this is not correct. The solution to this is to set the depth to minus the point we are moving to at the start of the path, which is hex moves Y position, like this. And then we don't have a situation where it looks all messed up after you move. So now we need to make sure that the characters can't move on top of one another. So first let's delete the lines that create a hex at the selected players X and Y, as we're going to add that at the bottom of the script instead. But first we need to destroy the hexes that are under the player characters. We do this by first creating a temporary variable called car num. This is going to get the total number of player characters that exist in the room. We then need to take control of the move hexes and remember, Everything inside this code block will happen in all instances of object hex move. So first, we need to set up a for loop that will happen as many times as there are player characters in the room. We then set up a new temporary variable called car ID, which is going to get each instance through the use of instance find, which finds each instance of the parent player. And then we will say, well, if X, and remember, this is the X's hex position, so if X, equals the car ID dot X and the Y equals the car ID dot Y then we'll, then we'll say instance destroy as this means that the hex is in the same position as another character. And now we create the hex underneath the selected character as the code above would have destroyed it if we had left it in the previous order. And there we are, we can no longer move to the same hex positions as the other characters. And now this is just a little bonus for the episode, we're going to add cool looking shadows to our characters However, I'm not going to explain anything that's happening here with the code, as I've been looking for an excuse for a while now to shout out Friendly Cosmonaut. She taught me how to do these shadows, and she's absolutely brilliant, so you'll find a link to her shadow video in the description. But yeah, this is how the shadows look, and I absolutely love this effect, so please, please go check out Friendly Cosmonaut. Massive thumbs up from me. So, I hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Hopefully you were able to take something away from that. Uh, if you have any comments, tips or suggestions, or just anything like that really, feel free to let me know in the comments, and I'll catch you in a bit. Hey guys, Lost here. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, subscribe if you're new and want more content like this, and please give me your thoughts down below in the comments. Catch you guys later.